Welcome to the Page and Stage podcast, where we explore the art and craft of writing and performance. I'm your host, Jason Cannon. My guest today is Maria Shadler Luera. Maria is a Brazilian-born educator, artist, and author based in Sarasota, Florida. She's an actor, improviser, operatically trained singer, and award-winning teacher, most recently receiving the Arts Leadership Award from the Arts and Cultural Alliance of Sarasota County and the Appleton Arts Integration Award from the Sarasota Performing Arts Foundation. Maria has served on the boards of several nonprofits, including Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed. She also consults with different foundations and nonprofits and designs teaching models and workshops focusing on culturally relevant teaching, applied theater, bilingual programs, and mental health. Maria holds a master's in intercultural relations and arts for social change, and she is certified in meditation, Reiki, and Ayurvedic health counseling. Maria also just wrote and published her first book. It's called Be the Protagonist, How Ayurveda, Meditation, and Theater Can Transform Your Life. Clearly, there will be plenty to talk about. Here we go with my conversation with Maria Shadler Luera. I am sitting here with the amazing Maria Shadler Luera, guest two on the Page and Stage podcast, and a very much fun bit of kismet that your husband, Will, was my guest last time, and now you're the guest, and it's like I'm opening with the Sarasota artistic power couple. It's just like, I feel so lucky. (laughs) (laughs) I feel lucky, too. (laughs) Maria, before we hopped on, just because when I when I came in here, you were walking a little funny, and yes. I checked in, and you're really big into physical fitness too, which we'll t- mm. talk about later because it ties to your artistic work as well. But you'd been off your CrossFitting for a couple weeks, and t- uh, tell the listeners uh, what happened yesterday. This is a great way to humanize. You know, we're artists and we're so important, but no, we're just people too. We are, we are. I know. I was I was uh, off for about a couple of weeks, and I I needed I need, I was just so busy with work and life, and I'm. I know I need to make time for myself. I need to. And it's important, right? Physical activity is really important because I do a lot of mental work. Right. Yeah. That is something I needed to create balance. And I went back to the gym after a while. So I'm just getting back into the groove. And we had to do uh, like toes to bar. And I was like, I'm just going to do kipping swings. uh, There's just to get into the groove. And a kipping swing. Explain that for people who don't do CrossFit. It's like literally (laughs) you hold on to a pull-up bar and you're swinging your body in front of your arms and then in the back like oh, okay. swing your body and you try to raise your legs as high as you can not necessarily touching the bar yet but okay. like trying to uh make yourself uh horizontal to almost like a gymnast like getting ready to exactly, dismount exactly like a gymnast and so you're high I'm off the ground this, i'm high off the ground on a high pull-up bar that i had to, i have to jump to, to even grab. hold on to <laughs> grab and i'm five foot eight uh so I'm doing this and I'm swinging and, and almost done with my count when my I lose my grip oh. and my hands uh, slip and I fall tailbone straight to the ground. Oh my God. And it was such a shock to my body. It was yeah. so painful and such a shock. And I was like, this is it. I'm done. <laughs> I, <laughs> I will never CrossFit again. It, it was horrible. But normally I don't get any injur- injuries right. in CrossFit, right? Um, I get injuries in life, <laughs> <laughs> but not in CrossFit. And it was like the first time I actually fell from uh-huh. a pull-up bar and hurt myself. And now I'm uh, literally just walking around with ice on my tail. <laughs> Funny that I'm number two for your interview. <laughs> I'm just like, it's so strange because it's like, wow, I feel the pain. And I'm like, yeah. you know, luckily I I, I, sit, I can move, but not without pain. And I know it's going to heal and I'm going to be fine, hopefully. Right. But it's one of those very humbling moments. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. And, and I always try to think, I'm like, okay, what is this telling me? What do I need to do? What's the lesson What's here? the lesson? <laughs> Sit down. Be still. Slow down a little bit. Maybe it's just slow down because, uh, Maria, you are just a nonstop world traveler for work, for pleasure, for family, for life. And I think in the last couple of months, I mean, your itinerary, your passport must be overflowing the last few weeks. Where have you been? I know. January started, uh, it was pretty intense. Uh, Mexico followed by Alabama, followed by Mexico again, <laughs> all in the same month. And, and just like between work and then re- school residencies and Mm -hmm. uh, projects and life and kids and Mm -hmm. two weddings (laughs) that I had to attend, (laughs) graduations and three birthday parties, including mine. (laughs) 
<laughs> it was very intense. Yeah. So it's maybe it's strong. just, it's the CrossFit God yeah. saying, hey. Slow down. Take a beat. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned traveling for work a couple times here and just the busyness of that. Yeah. Just a quick overview because you do so many things. But if you had to kind of okay. label yourself, like your career path right now, what would that be? I am, a, um, I would say I'm a consultant okay. uh, for anything related to arts, arts education, arts integration, wellness, well-being. And I, you know, have different tools that yeah. I use. And I work with all ages, with nonprofits, foundations, organizations. So that's a, I'm, I'm my own boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is awesome. Agency. <laughs> yes. That term, arts integration, and it's, it's very buzzy. It's very much out in the ether, but I'm betting a lot of listeners don't necessarily know precisely what that right. looks like. Yep. Um, if you could just unpack the idea of arts integration yeah, a little bit. Absolutely. So arts integration is mostly used within educational settings. So okay. um, a lot uh, a lot of times we think of like K-12 education when mm -hmm. we think of arts integration. And um, it is uh, the combination of an art form with another content or subject area. So okay. when you integrate art to learn whether it's an academic concept or, or, or something else that you know, students need to learn, and you use the arts to learn that, but it's not just uh, using the arts to learn it. You're also learning the art form at the same at time. At the same time. So you're right. learning both the art form and a content area. So I could be like teaching some science Absolutely. or math or yep. writing curriculum with theater and you would bring and in well. and almost like a buttress or like a dovetail, yeah. bring an artistic skill into yes. play that would help me learn both the scientific concept. Absolutely. And at the same time, sneakily teach me the spoonful of sugar. Yes, yes. <laughs> teach and me how to do the art thing too. Yeah. And the idea of like a true integration is that you are learning both. Right. You are meeting evolving objectives in both. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I have to toot both our horns here because so much of what you're talking about has gone into your first book. Maria is a first time published author with Ibis Books, um, and her book is called Be the Protagonist. And I just want to tee this up for you, Maria, to talk about this whole idea of being the protagonist, becoming the protagonist, how this idea manifested for you, and what drove you to write a book about it. Yeah, thank you for this question. So I've been, um, as I mentioned earlier, as a consultant in education or arts and also uh, well-being. So my well-being, you know, the well-being that I dive into, I dove into a couple of years ago is in the area of mindfulness and meditation, as well as Ayurveda, okay. which is uh, from India known as the science of life. It, it, it encompasses everything from your nutrition and your diet to your exercise, to your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health. Uh, um, and it's like a sister science of yoga. It comes from the same roots. And I was also doing theater. And I've always seen the connections between all of those yeah. uh, things. I call everything an art form. Those are all art forms for me. Meditation, as I describe in the book, the art of observing ourselves. Ayurveda, the art of observing life. Because mm -hmm. we really understand the elements that are present in nature as well as people. Yeah. And theater is the art of observing human actions. And so for me, I've always combined all of that. And I, you know, people would always be curious, like, how does Ayurveda made into your world and you're doing theater work? And, and so... Uh, for me, all of these uh, art forms are just uh, uh, parts of becoming your life, your life's protagonist or the best protagonist you can become. And I've been applying it to my life. And so it's, I've been on a journey of becoming a protagonist right. in my own life. And I, I've started being asked about in my workshops uh, every time I was teaching, like, do you have a book? Because I would talk about these things. My answer immediately was always not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it took me a long time to decide or take the steps to, I'm like, okay, I'm going to play this role now. I will step into the role of the writer and I, I want to, I will, I will write a book. So it was a very intentional choice on your part to go, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not a writer yet, but I can put that costume on. Right. I can play the character of published writer and by playing the character, achieve the, it's almost like a cart and horse. Don't do the thing, then call yourself the doer of the thing. Mm -hmm. Call yourself the doer of the thing right. and then you'll just naturally sort of do it. Right. Exactly. That's... Stepping into the role. Stepping into the role. Yes. Exactly. Right. I do want to say really quick, Maria, it, when you came to me with your book idea, one of the things that excited me so much was how your integration of Ayurveda, meditation, theater, the way you call them all art forms. Mm -hmm. 
that my personal mission and the whole mission of Page and Stage and Ibis Books is very similar. It's that in my first book, right, This Above All, How to Live an Artistic Life, that mm -hmm. art comes from the word artisan, which was a craftsperson. A hat maker was an artist, a shoemaker, a cobbler, a cheesemonger, che that, yeah. that the artistry came in the skillful replication of the thing that not art is some highfalutin conceptual, you have to be moved or the muse has to be there, but art as the work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the entry point into what you're doing, which is integrating all these ideas. They only integrate because you have to do the work on the front end. Does that does that jive with what you've been saying? Absolutely, absolutely, it is. And it is like the, the integration of all of these things. It's mm. uh, They're not isolated, right? right. There, there are connections. And I think what, what made me really want to write the book, besides people asking about it, right. like, oh, you know, I can see myself playing this role, let's play this role. <laughs> I, I wanted to be able to to explain the connection between all this. It, it served as a great exercise uh, to make things even clearer for myself. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew there was a connection, but I couldn't yet verbalize what that connection was. Oh, interesting. Others. So so you were living something, demonstrating something, even mm -hmm. teaching something, mm -hmm. but hadn't really yet fully articulated or exactly. captured or curated it yes. into almost a system or a exactly. point of view. or right. a... How do I explain this to somebody who knows nothing about any of those things or perhaps know well, just one of those things, right? Yeah. How these things connect. So talk a little bit about once you, once you decided to step into the role of author, mm -hmm. once you were like, okay, I guess I have to write a book now. I'm going to play this <laughs> character. What was that process like for you? Was was the protagonist idea on the front end? Did you kind of write your way yeah. into it? It became, so the title changed. Uh, and I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to just have this back and forth with you in the process of writing too, because initially I was looking at all of these things as part of the play of life. Right. And that's how I started. That was like the initial title I was thinking about. It really ties into also the old traditions of India and the Vedas, where meditation and Ayurveda comes from. Mm -hmm. And they call that Leela. Leela, right? right. The play of life or the game of life. So I was playing with those ideas, right? We are the actors in mm -hmm. uh, on the stage of life. And, and each one of us is the main character in our own life story. But really, uh, I think uh, Be the Protagonist, like that title uh, speaks even more to what I am doing. It's not just, it's not about the play. It's about the player. Yes. So that, um, but, but that only happened organically as we, you know, I started the process of writing and we had the back and forth and we had some amazing questions and reflections for me and then like how that really resonated. And I had not even realized that I had, even before that, I created a, a sweatshirt for me. I remember, right, the sweatshirt that, that said, said that be, be the, the protagonist, protagonist <laughs> breathe, meditate. It had a bunch of words that for me connected to what I was doing. I had the, that word already printed. It just uh, occurred to me later as like, that's really what this is about. Yeah. You mentioned that you are the main character, that each of us mm -hmm. is the main character of our own life. And you talk about this in the book. And I, I love this idea because it's so kind of uh, humbling and grounding, grounding. But if I'm the main character of my life, that mm -hmm. means that, you know what? I'm only a supporting character in yours. Absolutely. I might only have a walk-on part in someone else's. Mm -hmm. I may not even ever show up. And actually, I don't. In the vast majority of people on this planet, I'm not a character in their life at all. Exactly. Right? So there's, there's a, it's important to own the fact that you're the protagonist of yours while still leaving space and grace for everyone else to be the protagonist of theirs. So that there's a tension there too with our ego. It, Absolutely. Talk about how you address that, whether through the book or in your teaching or... Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important to know, yes, we have that agency. We are creating our lives and we are, you know, it's important to have this sense of like, we are in a journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that my hero's journey is more important than somebody else's hero's journey. Right. And I think it's, you know, and, and sometimes just this awareness might make us think about, am I playing an antagonist in somebody else's story? Oh, what right? a great question. Um, <laughs> that, that is possible. We don't like to think of ourselves as anybody's antagonist, but sometimes we do play that role. So it really depends. And sometimes it's not in a full story, but it's just in a little scene. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> a scene, a chapter in somebody's life. And we may have had moments in life like that where we play that antagonist, uh, you know, and I'm not talking about protagonist, antagonist as being good guy, bad guy. It's mm -hmm. not as simple as that. It's just when you're opposing somebody else mm -hmm. and you are presenting an obstacle or, you know, something that the protagonist wants and you are on the way of them getting that. And right. so it just, it, for me, it made me have more compassion to others as well as to just myself yeah without the ego but at the same time gave me agency it was yes. like okay i'm the hero of my story mm -hmm. i want to live that hero's journey now yeah. with that awareness the agency and the empathy go together because like, like you were even just saying that i might be the antagonist for someone else but it might not be my intention right exactly. i just might be pursuing because the world is so complicated right. and you might be an obstacle to me achieving my goal without even realizing exactly. it right someone it could be as simple as like someone cuts you off in traffic well right. maybe they're rushing to a doctor Doctors, but you, you don't right. know right. just exactly what role you are ever playing in someone else's Absolutely. story. Absolutely, no, you don't, and that's what life is, right? So many stories intertwine. All the same. Time. That's what <laughs> makes it so complicated, <laughs> but also beautiful. Like it's, yeah. it's. Uh, I find it fascinating just to know. But then to own the fact that you're the protagonist of yours is what probably ground you it could be chaos otherwise right yep. if you kind of zoomed out and just like well there's no one story what's going to hold you know you just fly away but if you can say well i'm going to just follow my right. path absolutely and do the best i can not to hurt someone else's absolutely yes it's a it's a conscious protagonist yeah an that's aware protagonist yes not just a protagonist who's like my story is more important right right <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> talk a bit more about your writing process, especially because, mm -hmm. I mean, as a teacher, arts integration, you're probably writing curriculum and mm -hmm. and, and uh, lesson plans and yeah. articles all the and presentations all the time. But how do you go from that to thinking in terms of creating a full-fledged book? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what kind of process did you go through to, to turn that writer brain on? Yeah. So I was never into that role before and I didn't know like what's the best way of approaching the writing and um, I loved that our initial conversations when you suggested like you know how important it is to create that routine yeah. and just write every day and that's how I then started <laughs> but I, I didn't start from nothing I had already handouts for different workshops and lesson plans that I have done in, in these different areas right in meditation Ayurveda and theater so I was kind of like mapping and outlining well, I definitely want this to be a part of the book or this or that. So I had an idea or an outline and I tried to then just start with that and sit every day and just write for an hour every day in the beginning until life uh, happened <laughs> and we had to deal with Hurricane Ian. Yeah. <laughs> you know, school is out for two weeks and then kids are home and then we have to do a lot of cleanup and it just completely changed the routine. And it's normal, right? Life happens yeah. and then you, yeah. you you can start a routine and then you, you know, break the routine and then you just get back to a routine. So my getting back to the routine was not exactly the same. I, I for this experience, and it might be different in the next uh, books that I hope to write. Um, <laughs> but I ended up doing a combination of some, you know, some weeks I was consistent. Other weeks I would spend hours and other weeks I would uh, just take a break. Yeah. Because I was also, as as I was writing about this, as the ideas were getting clearer in my in my mind and like what, how these things connect, I was also experiencing those things in the world. So oh, yeah. I think maybe for this book in particular, the reason why I was not sitting down every day writing from the beginning till the end is that I was then out there using these tools and applying and thinking it in, in, a, in a more critical way what I was doing. Almost like testing. Did I write right, that right? Right. Like a pilot study, right? <laughs> yeah. Like a case study, like an, I'm the protagonist. And right. I'm trying those things. And, that, uh, and, and I think that space in my writing gave me perhaps a different perspective. And I think uh, the book ended up becoming what it was because of that process. Mm -hmm. So it was like I was also writing about the process. Um, so that was a little different than I guess uh, for, but you know, but there's no, I, there's I, no I one never approached or, yeah. is, uh, yeah. you know, this as right or wrong. So mm -hmm. like, that's how, how it happened. That was my creative process. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the reasons that your book came together the way it did, and one of the reasons you access this integration place is because you're an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this a bit in the book too, but I've just heard you talk about it in conversation. Mm -hmm. The difference culturally between where you're from, Brazil, yeah. 
which you referred to, I believe, as a collective culture yeah. versus the United States. But you're now a citizen. You have dual right. citizenship. Yeah. But the United States, your experience has been that it's an individu individualistic culture. Yeah. And there is a particular story, like in a classroom, you tell, um, mm -hmm. I think, tell that story and then talk a bit more about your discovery and understanding of individualistic versus collective and how that informs your protagonist idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So, in, in you know, of course, this is a generalization that, yeah. you know, Brazil is collectivist and you know, United States, Europe uh, were individualistic. But there is a, an emphasis more on the I here mm -hmm. and then collectivist cultures, the we mm. um, and the community. And there are differences in just like how people interact with those uh, cultural nuances. So in a in a group setting, we tend to, in a collectivist culture, not necessarily interrupt people when they're talking, right? We are okay with silence. We wait for silence so then somebody else can offer something or speak. And like one of the biggest things that I, when I when I moved to the United States, I was in my mid-20s, I pretty much didn't speak at all, not, not because I had nothing to say, but I was in New York City and everybody was just like talking on top of each other and there was never silence. And so I always waited for that, but there was never a pause. And so that transferred to my experience in grad school when I, I was in Boston for that. And again, we're, we're, we're having group discussions in the classroom setting in grad school and I'm quiet, but I'm not the only one who's quiet. A lot of the other international students, for, uh, for like from Asia or yeah. South America, we're having the same experience. We're all very quiet. And so, you know, we have, we all get that same email from the professor. I'm like, are you understanding? Are you like, right. because you're not participating? I'm like, I am participating by yeah. listening and yeah. following the discussion in my mind. <laughs> I, was, I was there. I was present. And I know everything that was said, but I wasn't speaking. And but for me, it was like going against who I was, right. like interrupting people to get my point across. It, it was just like not in my nature. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult. I'm I'm getting better at this now. Twenty years later, <laughs> I'm getting better at interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm getting more comfortable doing something that you know initially went against my nature. Right. That was uh that was really important. So I think for me also the fact you know to become a writer to speak up to share mm -hmm. thoughts with people, uh, you know, maybe that's the reason why it took me so long to play that role. I'm uh, I'm very comfortable being the listener. I'm very comfortable being the observer. Yeah. Um, but at some point, there's just like all of these things you're observing and listening. There's just so much in your mind. There's, it feels, and I use a different analogy on the book that I talk about, the vision feels heavy, mm. right? And you just like, for me, then the book allowed me to organize some of these thoughts. And then sh by sharing it, just like even feeling lighter, right, mm -hmm. as the protagonist. Okay, I have something to say here. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not interrupting people. You have to actually read the book. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I, when you say heavier, are, re are you referring to that kind of gorgeous parable in your book about the backpack? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think, go ahead, share that. Yeah, share the backpack that. traveler. Uh, it w it's, a, it's a beautiful analogy that really resonated with me when I first heard it was shared by a friend. Uh, you know, the idea is that there's this backpack traveler who is going on this, you know, world travel to discover the meaning of life. And he's just like on, on a search. And and as she travels the world and she arrives in a place, you know, she gets a book. Like that's the metaphor, gets a book and learns everything about that culture, right? And then puts that book in her backpack and then keeps going, um, get to another place, get a book, read and learn about that culture, that place, those people, that language, put the book in the backpack and keep going. At some point, that backpack is so heavy, mm -hmm. full of books, that the traveler can't move forward anymore. Mm -hmm. So there is only one thing to do. She needs to start removing those books from the backpack. So that is the idea of sharing, right? So, okay, she goes and picks the one that's right in the bottom, like in another place, and shares, this is something about another culture, another yeah. place, and then shares that and then leaves the book behind. It's like, mm -hmm. I already know this. I read it and I shared it. So I'm going to leave it here now. Yeah. And it keeps moving forward until the backpack is light again. So it, it gives more space. Now she can travel and learn even more things and add mm -hmm. more things for her backpack. But then it, it has to, there has to be a balance yeah. with this learning, uh, you know, with knowledge, but also the experience and the sharing. Yeah. 
And that for me is like when the book represented that, like I definitely felt lighter and I really felt lighter. Like the moment where I felt like, oh, I removed a backpack was when I finished my first full draft. Oh, there was still a lot of changes. A lot of work to do. A lot of work. But that first draft, I I literally felt I removed a backpack from my back. Yeah. It felt much lighter. Oh, that's so cool. You're there's kind of two things going on there metaphorically that made that story jump for me. And one is that it's kind of um, identifying the artist or storyteller, the traveler, Mm -hmm. as the conduit Mm -hmm. of information between different cultures who may not have access to each other. That the the artist, the traveler, the immigrant Mm -hmm. kind of purposely places themselves between to become the the way that ideas can transfer between different cultures, mm-hmm. right? With the, yeah. we As storytellers, as writers, as theater artists, as whatever, we almost choose, not isolation, but we choose to be between communities at times mm-hmm. to facilitate that sharing of knowledge. Absolutely. Or ideas or, or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And the other side of that is the, the importance of letting go. Mm -hmm. right that if you learn something if you cling to it are you actually killing it as opposed to sharing it exactly what's the purpose right Right. of uh, accumulating all that knowledge if i'm not gonna share anything Mm -hmm. or how that taught me right in this case the book is like you know all of that not all of the knowledge that i got from theater ayurveda and meditation is helping me become my life's protagonist so Mm -hmm. the, the idea is let me share how that is true to me and And here are some exercises you can do and see what it's, you know, if that helps you. Yeah, absolutely. I always saw myself also as a bridge. Like I've used that metaphor so many times. Yeah. It's a bridge between cultures or languages because I've, you know, speaking other languages, it was very natural for me in many times in my life to play the role of the translator and interpreter, (laughs) literally. But yes, it's so it's whether it is a bridge between people, between languages, between cultures, between uh, an art form and the practice of that art form. So I've I've always seen myself as a bridge, and that is um, for me. It's um, this understanding. It's like I'm I'm the bridge type of protagonist too. Like that, it's it's a very specific kind of protagonist. Hey, this is Jason, and we'll get right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that Page and Stage is way more than this podcast. If you go check out pageandstage.art, that's pageandstage.art, you'll find a weekly newsletter full of tips, tricks, encouragement, and inspiration for storytellers of all stripes. You'll also find the online bookshop for Ibis Books, which is the publishing wing of Page and Stage, and which just published Maria's book. And if you're working on your play, novel, memoir, or speech, you can even set up some one-on-one story coaching with me. Again, that's pageandstage.art. And now back to my conversation with Maria Shadler Luera. One of the theater art forms that you participate in Mm -hmm. is called, I believe, playback theater. Yes. And I would love to just give you some space here to talk about uh, that particular type of theater because it's it's not done uh, in the United States as much as in other countries. And I think you even worked with Augusto Boal. So, yeah, so playback is different than theater field press. Okay, great. Okay. So <laughs> help me out. Help me and the yeah. listeners out. I haven't been to grad school in a while. Uh, so you mentioned two different, uh, two different types of theater here. You mentioned playback and then you mentioned Oguspoal, which is theater field press. So, uh, and I've done both. On the book, I talk specifically about theater field press. So I'll explain that one first. So theater field press is an applied theater form. It was created by Augusto Boal, a Brazilian theater director. And he was, you know, doing theater in Brazil uh, during a time of military military dictatorship. And there was a lot of uh, very specific oppression from the government to the people, yeah. censorship for the arts, and all, all of that was happening. And he has an incredible story. He inspired his work. The Theater of the Press is actually inspired by the work of a, a Brazilian educator called Paulo Freire, who developed the pedagogy of the oppressed. So it comes from that idea that... The, the pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed. The oppressed. Okay. So the idea of pedagogy of the oppressed is that Teachers are not supposed to come to a, an education settings and just deposit knowledge into the student. We call that banking education, right? Your oh, okay. Teachers are just in, uh, imparting knowledge and students are passively just absorbing that. We have to develop that back and forth critical literacy, right? Students are as much as a part of their learning as teachers are also. So there is like that exchange. Uh, so pedagogy of the press has a lot of that connection, like that critical 
literacy aspect, like so, like students are not passive observers. Right. So theater of the oppressed is the same. A person being oppressed by a system, by a government, or by an external or an internal oppression, right, can't be in that role of being the passive observer because in life, we are not just the audience or spectators. We are also actors. So in Theater of the Press, we say we are spect actors. Spect actors. <laughs> and that is the term we use. Uh, and so it's a, a, an umbrella of a variety of theater techniques to help uh, the person who is suffering any kind of oppression to become the spect actor. So mm -hmm. um, again, going back to that idea of the protagonist, there are times in my life where I'm I'm the protagonist. There are times in my life I'm the antagonist. There are times in my life I'm a bystander, right, and a witness. Mm -hmm. So in, in Theater of the Oppressed, we role play real life scenarios to uncover all these roles. But the, the main idea is to always find a creative ways or, or just help that person, the protagonist who's being oppressed, mm -hmm. to feel empowered, to take charge of their lives. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in many ways. And that was... A life inspiration for me. Um, I've I've had the opportunity to study with him when he was alive, and mm. I still do this work. I I'm currently organizing a conference uh, related <laughs> to this uh, here in Florida. An um, entire conference for yeah. playback. No, for theater for the press. I have reversed yeah. those twice now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed International Conference happening um, this coming May. Oh man, end of May, early June. And where will that be? That's going to be at Eckerd College. Eckerd College up in St. Pete. Yeah. Great. And so it's a, it's been a big part of my life. It really mm -hmm. impacted my life, but also my work as I facilitated this work with different communities and groups. And it's it's really it really helped me understand and live this idea that everybody is the protagonist of their lives, mm -hmm. right? And I am the protagonist of my own, because when we are doing these workshops, we're thinking about, like, what is my life like as the protagonist? What do I want as the protagonist? What's keeping me from achieving what I want? What are my obstacles? Yeah, that's um, so that's it's a mindset shift. So when when you're working with someone or even for yourself mm -hmm. to, to put on to to accept, OK, there's almost a responsibility. Absolutely. That your agency comes with responsibility. Now you have to behave as a protagonist. Yep. If you're going to claim that then kind of all the all the choices you make mm -hmm. all the behaviors you start investing in by they naturally have to shift absolutely was there a moment uh you talked about when you were writing the book and putting the process into practice and everything else and the idea of the protagonist as the title and the theme mm -hmm. was there a particular moment where it thing where you kind of realized oh my gosh I'm I'm the protagonist, or I have just put that on, and mm -hmm. it feels good. It fits. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I think it's been, uh, you know, this process, you know, when I think of the protagonist, you know, I sort of think, okay, it's that idea of, like, stepping into the spotlight in a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. You are a protagonist in, in a play, right? You're the main character, mm -hmm. right? And you're the protagonist. You're the hero in a movie. So there's that, uh, I have that visual of stepping into a spotlight. And I feel like most of my life, especially uh, when I became an immigrant, I'm I'm another character there, uh, but I'm not on the spotlight. I am because I'm observing. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm on the you know the sidelines. I'm very comfortable being on the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> and I you know at some point I realize okay, I do need to step into the spotlight. Yeah. Not for an ego reason, but because. I know a lot of things that can help other people do the same for themselves. Mm -hmm. So for me, for uh, so I'm realizing that stepping into the, into the spotlight, so becoming the protagonist, is uh, my way to show people that they can do the same in their lives. So it, there's that. It's not just because of me. It's mm -hmm. it's also so I can teach others uh, that they can do the same. It can facilitate yeah. that experience for others. Sometimes you need that, right? Like, oh, when we see that uh, protagonist finally coming into the spotlight, sometimes like we, you know, after whatever, like in any stories or movies, and we see that the moment of empowerment, right? Yeah. We all feel like we are we are feeling empowered too. Yes. And so I know it is important. And, and also I think about, I have two daughters, I was just, I, I was literally thinking it might be yeah. presumptuous, but how has being the protagonist affected you as a mother? Absolutely. So, you know, I grew up with a mom who gave, 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 gave so much all the time and everybody else was more important, right? Mm. Very nurturing, 
but didn't really put herself first. And and it's not like I'm putting myself in front of my kids. So, you know, like, but in my, I mean, I have to take care of myself. I have to say, like, I have to step into this role of the, the protagonist and the spotlight, even if it's just to model and show my girls that you, each one of them is the same, you know, the protagonist in their own lives. And I want them to know that they should put themselves first as well in their lives, especially for like for girls and women. We have, yeah. you know, the, the, the whole thing of like we have to be you know, the mother and the nurturing and the, yeah. and, and it's, it's okay to stop into the spotlight. So it, it, I think it gave me the motivation to I'm like, you know, I have to do this while they're in my house observing me. Right. <laughs> yes. Some point, they're out in they're the, the audience. <laughs> in my audience observing things that I do every day. Yeah. So it, it became even more important for me to do that. So the immigrant thing that's come up a few times, you came from Brazil to the United States. I'm curious, what was the inspiration or instigation for that? What mm -hmm. what drew you to leave home mm -hmm. and go elsewhere? Mm -hmm. That's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> so I had already had experiences living abroad before I moved to the United States. So in high school, I was an exchange student for a year. I lived with a host family and friend. Okay. And uh, finished high school there. And then in college, I did a study abroad semester in, in Austria. Uh, so I have had that experience and I've always loved to immerse myself in another culture. So I think since I was a kid, I mean, that was always something I knew I wanted to do and I was going to do as many possible times, like as many times as I could. The United States was not in the cards for me initially. I was not thinking I'm going to move to the United States. That was uh, like not a specific clear goal, but that's because of how people's stories intertwine, you know, when we're talking about my protagonist story intertwining with somebody else's story. Yeah. So I was in a relationship in Brazil in my early 20s. And my boyfriend at the time had received a scholarship to study at Berkeley uh, College of Music. Oh, wow. Boston, and said, you know, decide, I'm okay, I'm, I'm going to go to Boston. I'm going to go do their program. And so at the time... I, I I thought, oh, it's the United States. Okay. Well, perhaps I can find something there for me too. And we can both move and, and just be there for a while. So I started researching, like, what can I do? What do I want to do? And uh, at the time, I was uh, really in the world of music. I, you know, started singing at an early age, part of groups and, and choirs and did uh, opera. Uh, and then our our you know groups started doing a, like a little bit of Broadway and musical theater. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what? If I, I could dive a little bit more into musical theater, I don't know much about it. And that's the place to learn about musical theater. It's like, yeah. Uh, so I found a program in New York City, uh, AMDA, American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And I auditioned and I got in. I felt like, OK, we're good. You go to Boston, do Berkeley. I go to New York. I do AMDA. And we we'll take travel, the train to see each other. <laughs> take the train and all, all of that is great. And then about a few months before uh, the trip was supposed to happen, he comes to me and, and, and tells me that he's not going anymore. Whoa. And, you know, he had his own obstacles uh, and that I'm, it's not relevant right now. His own uh, reasons to, to not uh, do this, to not take that uh, step, that chapter. Mm hmm and at that moment, I had to think, I'm like, do I stay or right. do I go? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I'm like, well, I will always wonder if I don't go. Right. I'm like, I will uh, ask myself. Now, now I went there. I auditioned. I already saw the school. I'm like, I'm excited to live mm -hmm. in New York City at this mm -hmm. point and have that experience. And I'm like, well... My, I, I, I've, it's, um, I didn't have that language before at the time, but I, I knew you were being that the protagonist, but didn't even know it. As the protagonist, yeah. I needed to go on this trip. I mean, this trip changed my life well, in a lot of ways. <laughs> I yes. moved to the United States uh, to just spend two years uh, in this conservatory program, and it's been twenty now. You know, like I'm married and I have kids, and I'm now a citizen here, and so it completely changed my mind. But it was not initially an like if it wasn't for that for my story crossing with his story. Mm -hmm. I I wonder if I would or maybe something else would have happened later that I was going to end up here. Yeah. But that was the moment. And it was it felt very much like that. OK, that's the reason why that story connected with my story. Yep. So my story could shift and go into another path. Mm -hmm. That is. And now that's where I am. <laughs> <sighs> it's not that it's random. Mm -hmm. Right. Because story is all about uh, we look backwards. Right. Story mm -hmm. only manifests when you look back and mm -hmm. see the twists and turns and cause effect. Right. But when you're in it, 
you don't realize you're a tipping over domino when you're in it. You only can notice that mm -hmm. by looking backwards and going, Absolutely. oh, like I can trace my entire yeah. theater career, 25 years worth, back to one specific audition in St. Louis for Donna Northcott at St. Louis mm -hmm. Shakespeare Company. That one, mo that was like my first trying to, I'm just flailing around doing show, trying to figure things out. And from that one audition, I could trace back like a, like a graph. Mm -hmm. Well, that show, I met this person and this person and that director, I got reviewed by them. And then I met this person and yeah. it all, I could trace it all back to that one. Yes. That one spot. Yeah. With Donna Northcott and St. Amazing, Louis, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and you don't want you almost can't you almost can't think of it that way in the moment because the mm -hmm. pressure would be debilitating. Absolutely, like this you, moment, my whole life you, depends exactly. on this moment. <laughs> it's not we don't have to figure it out. It's it's almost like following an intuition too. Like it's very mm, yeah. right being in the moment and following that urge to like I'm going to go do this audition now. Right, whatever took you to do yep. that. I I've always felt the same in so many instances. I'm like, I don't know why, but now I'm signing up for this meditation teacher certification. Yeah. I'm like, I just know it's the next thing I need to do. And and then I went to Ayurveda and then I like I started doing all these things. I knew I needed to go in that direction. Yeah. But I did not know yet uh what how all of that connected. Yeah. Because you could even just the rabbit hole there, right? So even I'll just continue with this idea of that, that audition for St. Louis Shakespeare at Dunn Northcott. The reason I was there, because you kind of just asked that, yeah. was my when I was in college, I was in college an hour away, and our theater prof drove us over there to see a production of Richard III mm -hmm. at St. Louis Shakespeare. And I remember watching that thinking, I think I could I could be on that stage with those people. I'm, I think I'm good enough, right? And that's mm -hmm. so that theater now was implanted in my brain. Yes. And I was at Greenville College. Because that's where my parents had gone and my great, you know, and you could trace it all the way back to my great grandmother who went to that college in 1896 when it was an all woman school called Elmira. You know, I mean, if you go down the rabbit hole yeah. of cause effect, right. where does it stop? Right. I know, I so know. the almost the part of part of being an artist is releasing all that causality and focusing on the day to day work mm -hmm. and trusting yeah. that your path will just keep being what it's supposed to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's really fun. <laughs> I haven't thought about St. Louis Shakespeare and Donna. I mean, I owe Donna Northcott a lot. I haven't. So if she's listening, I mean, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you mentioned at one point a few minutes ago, Maria, um, possibly writing next books. Yes. And so I know you have all these ideas for a protagonist series or yeah. upcoming books, even with your daughter. I would. Yeah. So tell us kind of what this one book now, mm -hmm. what your Donna Northcott book, yeah. <laughs> what's going to spring out from that? What, what's, what do you think the next uh, yeah. manifestations of the protagonist series are? So um, now that I wrote this first book, many, many things came to mind. One is, uh, so you, as you mentioned, my daughter, um, it's a children's book. Like I'm thinking, of course, this book is not a children's book. Right. And, uh, but I think this idea of becoming your life's protagonist or understanding you are the main character of your own story, something mm -hmm. like, we should teach kids that oh, at an early age, yeah. right? We don't learn this in school, right? So I have this idea of writing. Uh, now I'm in the process of writing a children's book that is not necessarily about Ayurveda meditation and theater, but specifically just this language of being your life's protagonist mm -hmm. for kids. And my daughter, um, I, who's 11, uh, my youngest daughter, she loves drawing and, and painting and all of that. And so I asked her, would you like to be the illustrator of my book? In many ways, also showing her how she can take on different roles and step into her life as the protagonist, right? So to collaborate, right? Two protagonists collaborating. Mm -hmm. I know, Layla. I've got to watch her grow up, so I'm so curious. I've never asked you this, so I'm really curious. Mm -hmm. When you offered her this yes. opportunity, mm -hmm. What was her response? Did she pull out a contract? Like I'm, I can I can see Layla doing so many so things. So she didn't ask yet about how much money she's going to make, but I'm sure that's coming up because it's going to come up once we release it. Right. Because she, but she did ask because she went to the book release for Be the Protagonist, mm -hmm. and she saw people were buying books, right? So she's going to ask, and but she did ask. I'm like, are we going to have a book event? I'm like, yeah, we're going to have a book event when that happens. So I'm just waiting for that to happen. Right, she's gonna show up with her so lawyer, that's my part, <laughs> her you agent. Know, like I need my, I need my cut on this. Uh, <laughs> of course, I'm gonna be fair. <laughs> Oh, man. And that, as the publisher, I'm like, oh, man, she's going to come at me hard. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
So you have the protagonist for kids. Uh, what what other mm-hmm. ideas do you have kind of bubbling? So now? Um, I've I've had the opportunity in the last two years to do a lot of my work with trauma survivors, mm. and it's this idea of also being the protagonist of your life. So when you're experiencing trauma or obstacle, right? Sometimes the your last entire you life like. is yeah. dictated by that obstacle and that trauma. And there is the agency of understanding you're the protagonist, also that you can rewrite your narrative mm. or write a new one, mm-hmm. um, can be really powerful. So I'm not a therapist, but the work of uh, that we can do through theater exercises and and through this, uh, you know, the lens of becoming our life's protagonist can be therapeutic. So my next book is I've you know I've for the last two years I wrote so many workshops and lesson plans yeah. uh, and activities and things that I've done with these groups and some of the people that I work with I've been I've seen them they are they come back every month for the workshop and so I've been working with them for over a year and I see them in this this role of stepping into their own protagonist uh, role. And I think it can be very, you know, very beneficial for other people. So my goal is to now I'm thinking about, okay, be the protagonist uh, for specific audiences. Okay. So my next audience for my next book uh, will be trauma survivors or anybody experiencing trauma. So it's it's uh, going to be a little more specific to the resilient protagonist. That's right? so good. Uh, but I also have other ideas later in the future. I'm like, when I think about like, this is a great idea for a series. And I'm now I can be more specific to different audiences. Like parents, you are mm-hmm. raising protagonists. Yes. So how can I share my experience with this awareness? of raising my daughters, right? And, and, and impart that uh, to other parents out there. And so now I have all of these ideas and it's really exciting because uh, it's like it was it's like planting a seed and now I'm, I'm just gonna I'm creating a full garden yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of all these ideas. And it's like as an artist, it's so exciting because you know it's part of my creative process. Oh, and and as actors, I mean, we always think about our audience. We're very specific to as a teacher, I think about my audience. Who am I talking to? Who am I teaching? Mm-hmm. Five year olds or adults, right? And I I'm going to be specific with that language. Yeah. So so I'm excited about the protagonist series and how um, all of that is going to take place. Well, even conceptually, you just went for me then being a parent to being a teacher. I mean, the mm-hmm. the, the flexibility of the protagonist mask, right? Mm-hmm. When you walk into the classroom and you're yep. the teacher, you're the protagonist who is there to inter... Yep. I loved what you said earlier. I'm not here just to tell you something. I'm here to help you think better, yes. think stronger, think more for yourself. I am the hero of the classroom. Mm-hmm. I come home and now I am the hero of the homestead mm-hmm. <laughs> or wherever you go, whatever yeah. kind of role you're in, even if you're, even if you're a CrossFit, right? Right. You're still there. And as a, as a team, I'm, you're all heroes in terms of we're improving our bodies. We're building community yes. there. It, it, it becomes such a flexible way to think about how you interact with mm-hmm any kind of community you go that you have business or life issues with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, this idea of the protagonist, like this book, you know, even though I wrote for other people to read has been so impactful for my own life <laughs> that um, I, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to finally take that active role and, and, and the opportunity to work with you that made this possible and, and, and it's in in a clear way. I mean, there's such an important role that you have played in the in shaping this book uh, and asking me questions. I'm a supporting character. <laughs> <laughs> and I love what you said too. I, listeners out there who whatever kind of storyteller they are or if they're audience mm-hmm. or readers, you just said mm-hmm. that uh, you wrote this book for other people but ended up realizing you actually learned more about yourself in the process. You almost wrote the book to yourself, yeah. for yourself. And yeah. for anyone else out there who's a storyteller, even if you're an audience member or a reader, that idea of applying an artistic mindset, mm-hmm. protagonist mindset, when you're creating for other people, it could be food, it could be mm-hmm. medicine, it could be leading a service. Mm-hmm. So much of that will bounce back to you. You yeah. will, to take it back to what you said, it's the cart horse, it's put the character on first Mm -hmm. and you'll find you're capable of doing the things you wanted to do instinctively. Absolutely. This reminds me of something I share oftentimes in my workshops. I'm the kind of teacher who 
share is this, especially with my adult uh, groups, is that, you know, we teach what we need to learn the most. <laughs> so when I'm, when I'm giving them an exercise and I'm asking them to step into a vulnerable uh, role, to share, to express, I need to be willing to do that myself. Yeah. And I say, like, I'm also learning this. As you are learning it now, I am, I'm reminding myself of these tools mm -hmm. and how important it is to be vulnerable, to step and express myself and all of those things. So I love the opportunity to teach what I teach because it, I'm, I am teaching myself. I am <laughs> I'm teaching what I need to learn. <laughs> hey, Maria, I always like to uh, wrap up with the mm -hmm. same three questions here. So we'll start out with uh, number mm -hmm. one here. What is the best advice you've ever taken? I love advice. <laughs> I love words of inspiration. <laughs> I, the, the one that came to mind when I saw this question was less is more. Less is more. And I've been finding a way, whether it's to clarify every single time what I'm teaching, what is the essential components? How can I make it clear, hmm. accessible for mm -hmm. people? To it, it applies into so many areas of my life, right? From like definitely writing. Right. To yeah. like to, you know, write long paragraphs or just like, you know, how can I can say those things in, in fewer words? It's going to be clearer and more accessible for people, but also at home, just like, you know, surrounding myself with fewer but higher quality things mm -hmm. like we don't need much. Right. Yeah. Less is more. This this has been uh, something that just in every area of my life I find important also for the planet. It's more sustainable yeah. like, uh, for everything. Uh, so thinking about everything I do in life from that perspective, less is more. What can I what can I remove here? What's the noise? Like what let's do some decluttering and yeah. what what is not necessary in this moment? Yeah. The word essential, I love that word, yeah. especially when it comes to story, art, writing. Yes. Can you say in 10 words what you just took 50? Exactly. And it's gonna be so much more impactful. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> less is more. <laughs> Great. And what is the uh worst advice mm -hmm. that you've ever given? I was thinking about this, and it's interesting because it goes back to earlier when I'm, I was talking about being the listener and the observer. I feel like I've, I was in that role even uh, like in my own culture so much hmm. that I couldn't think of one specific advice that was like the worst advice I've given. So the thing that came to mind was the, ad the worst advice was the one I never gave. Oh. And, and sometimes, so whether we call that silence, right, not speaking. And I, I, I went back to uh, this memory in middle school immediately where we had, I had, uh, there was uh, this girl in my classroom who had been held a couple of times. So she was like older than everybody else. Yeah. She was like high school age, but she was in, still in middle school. And she, I, I was always the kid who people would come and tell their secrets to because I was, you know, I would always keep everybody's secrets and not, and, and not speak. I was just a good listener. Yeah. And she came to me one day and told me she was going to run away with her boyfriend. Oh. And I just did what I normally do. I stayed quiet. I just listened to her. I let her speak. And I, I don't know if at the time, you know, I didn't have that much life experience. I was in middle school. And the next week she wasn't in school anymore and I never saw her again. Whoa. And so it's all, like, that's not a, like a haunting memory, but I always wonder. I still think about her. I cannot even remember her name anymore. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't say anything. I didn't give her any advice. I didn't tell like, no, you shouldn't run away right. from home. What is this about? I just listened to her and I always wonder, maybe she did, maybe she did not. Maybe she was just saying that and also, but I will never know. Right. And so it's a, it's an interesting thing because it goes back to that idea of like not sometimes not sharing, right? Yeah. I, I rather say something, make a mistake and then just like, I'm sorry, that was a really terrible advice, right? Mm -hmm. If things turn out in a different way, then sometimes not say something. So yeah. that really stayed with me and I'm hoping that, you know, <laughs> that she's okay. <laughs> She's with your ex-boyfriend. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And finally, Maria, some space for you. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have coming up? Where can people find you? Where can they take a class with you? I know you have a company called Ars Atomica. Yeah. I know you have some workshops coming Absolutely. up, but tell everyone yeah. where to find you. So the best way is to go to my website, uh, www.atomica-arts.com. Atomica-arts.com. Correct. Great. And in there you have the links to Atomica's social media as well, Facebook, Instagram, or whatever you prefer. And any time I'm doing any free workshops, 
definitely have a few coming up in April, some free online workshops that I'm going to offer. It, I'm going to be sharing them on my social media. Great. Uh, but on my website, then you will find things that I can offer, how to contact me, my email, you know, different ideas. I can customize my work to right. the needs of who I'm working with. Right. I mean, because you, you lead meditation, you teach yes. yoga, you I do, do Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic consultation. consultation. So there's a variety of services. They're all on my website. So that's the best <laughs> way to find me. <laughs> those uh, free workshops, those are through, remind me who those are through. Yeah. So the free workshops I'm going to offer are going to be for ages uh, teen and up in adults. And they're going to be through the 15-day festival coming up in April, Remake Learning Days, Suncoast Remake Learning Days, that is uh, organized and supported by the Patterson Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, my workshops are going to be on Zoom. So it doesn't matter where you live. Oh, you super accessible. Me. Yeah. Um, so one, and, and these workshops are all going to relate to one of the chapters in my book. One will connect to meditation, one to Ayurveda, one to theater. You can take all three. <laughs> <laughs> Or just one, but they're all going to be free on Zoom. All information is on my website. Awesome. And of course, as your next books come out and uh, uh, Layla's illustrations yes. come out, we will definitely be sharing that information as well. Maria, thank you so much for taking the time today and just really appreciate all your generosity for both listening and for sharing today. Thank you. And uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say we hope your tailbone heals quickly. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, that will take a little time, but that's okay. Maybe maybe they do, you know, take this time to just uh, slow down, sit down and uh, write. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Just that's write some more book. <laughs> You've been listening to the Page and Stage podcast. All my thanks to this episode's guest, Maria Shadler Luera, and to all of you out there for listening. Send me your thoughts and questions at jason at pageandstage.art. I always love to hear from you, and I'll be featuring your questions on future episodes. This podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one online podcasting app created by Colin and his amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. Be sure to listen next time when my guest will be USA Today best-selling author Don Bruns. His newest book coming out in July is Back in Black, an anthology of thriller short stories which includes a new Jack Reacher story. You won't want to miss my conversation with Don Bruns. Until then, I'm Jason Cannon, and I cannot wait to hear your story.